Failures are part of our life. As human, we have all failed, probably many times in our life. But the software system that we build can fail too. Here we have a simple thing job that read from a Kafka source, calls an external service to enrich the data, then write the output to a sync. We can introduce a bug in our application code. Our dependency service may return bad data. The sync we can write to may fail. Here are three important questions. First, how can we recover the thing job from failure? Second, how do we reprocess the data from outage periods? Third, what are the implications to downstream consumers? Today, I'm going to share our failure recovery story in the stream processing platform we're building at Netflix. I'll first give you a quick introduction of the stream processing platform we're building on top of Apache Flink. Then we'll dive deep into those two solutions that we provided for failure recovery. We'll first look into using Hive Data Warehouse as a backfill source. Then we'll look at the second solution we're using Flink external checkpoint for failure recovery. Then we're going to compare those two options, look at their pros and cons. In the last section, we're going to look at some of the caveats we should watch out for. We are building a stream processing platform on top of Apache Flink. It provides integration with Netflix ecosystem, like our continuous delivery system, Spinnaker, our container runtime platform, Tidus, and many other things. The other goal we want is to make stream processing so easy that even a caveman can do it. That is our slogan. Let me show you a couple of things. One of the common problems is to bootstrap a brand new project. It involves create a code repository, uh, write a build script, figure out the dependency libraries, and create a Jenkins job. All those boilerplate tasks take time, maybe a couple hours. We want to automate that. Looks like we have some difficulty in loading the video from Oh, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, this one? Yeah. Sorry for the technical dick for this. So we provide a temporary generation using our Newt, which is a work command line workflow toolkit. You can generate a new project using the template we provide called Space Job. It will ask you a few simple questions. I don't expect you to read all the text on the, on the screen. I'll just uh, walk, through, walk you through it. It will ask you which directory you want to create a project. Uh, do you like set up a static code repository? Do you want to set a Jenkins job? Which project do you want to create a static repo? And the name of a static repo? And the Jenkins master? Finally, it'll ask you the Java or Scala template. I'll choose Java because I'm, I like Java more. <coughs> you can see within a literally a minute, we can create a new template project for you. Now the user can run the project in their field IDE, or they can even deploy this project in the our cloud infrastructure. That greatly reduce the benefit entries, make it easy for users to just try things out. The general project has some dummy code, basically read from Kafka source and write to a now sync. 
Another thing, basically just log, log the output in a debug level and just drop it. Now user can add some business logic. For example, it can create, add a key by operator followed by a tumbling window function, then a reduce function, and then write the output to a hive sync. Let's say user tests this code. It's ready to deploy in our cloud infrastructure. Let me show you how easy to do that in our platform. User need to provide application name and a stack name. Stack allows us to run multiple jobs under the same application. For example, you can have a live job and you can have a backfield job. Or you can have a production job and you can have a candidate job. Then you provide our uh, own email address, and the next one is Docker image name. I want to enable this job in test environment in US East One region. I'm choosing the latest Docker image version. Then I can create a printing job in our system. After the job is created, user can deploy the job. That's all you need to do to create and deploy the job in your infrastructure. One of the main features we provide in our system is to automatically extract the application config user defined in the property files. We expose them as a job config so that the user, user can choose to override any config during deployment time because the property file is a part of your baked in Docker image. For example, it's very common the Kafka class name between the test environment and production environment are different. So user will need to override the Kafka class that we produce during deployment time when it's trying to deploy the job in the production environment. User can choose to override any other job config, like a Flink checkpoint interval. And user can configure the resource required for the job. For example, here, I configure two containers each with a CPU, one gigabit of network, and 27 gigabytes of memory. With this quick introduction of our stream platform, stream processing platform, now let's look into our failure recovery story. I first talk about how do we use Hive data warehouse as a backfield source. For stream processing, the application consumed from Kafka topic. So our Keystone data pipeline, we deliver the data to a Kafka topic. But in addition, our Keystone data pipeline also delivers data from, to Hive table because there are typically some batch processing need on the same data set. Since the data lives in the Hive data warehouse as a long-term storage, we are wondering, can we leverage those data for failure recovery for a Flink job? This is how it works. The live job had an outage. It recovered either automatically or through manual intervention when the underlying problem gets fixed. We let the live job continue to run. Meanwhile, user can start a parallel backfield job that read from a hive table. It will scan the data from the outage period, and the backfield job will stop when it's done with scanning the data from the outage period. We implement a Hive source on the data stream API. It's not a Flink batch job that's using the data set API. The reason is we want the user to be able to switch the source from Kafka to Hive during deployment time. To do that, user needs to define what we call dynamic source. I don't, I don't expect to read the code. I walk through the high-level concept. So user will first define a Kafka source. And the second step, user define a Hive source. And in the third step, user define a dynamic source that declare with a Kafka source and Hive source. And during deployment time, user can choose which source to use. Now user can create a Hive backfield job under the same application as a live job. We just use a backfield as a stack name. It will be the same Docker image name. 
It will also be the same Docker version. User just need to switch the source from a Kafka source to a Hive source. That's all user need to do to launch a backfill job. To read from a Hive table, user need to provide the Hive database name, Hive table name, and a SQL where clause basically defines the outage period where we want to reprocess data. So it's typically some date and hour. This is not a Lambda architecture, where you have a batch job that produces accurate results, but maybe longer delay. And you have separate code base where you have streaming job that can produce real-time output, but maybe less accurate. Here, we have the single streaming code base. User just need to switch the source from Kafka to Hive. We think the high backfill solution is probably not going to work for the stateful jobs for two issues. First is a warm-up issue. Second is ordering issues. We're going to look in those two in depth. For stateful jobs, each input record is evaluated against the application state that builds over time. For the high backfill job, because we switch the source from Kafka to Hive, we change the job deck, so we cannot start the Hive backfill job using a checkpoint or a save point from Flink. So we typically start the Hive backfill job with an empty state. When the input record is evaluated against the empty state or incomplete state, it may produce inaccurate result. You may wonder, why don't we add a warm-up period so that we can build up the proper application state before we reprocess the data from the outage period? That sounds good. That probably can work. And how long this warm-up period needs to be is highly dependent on the use case. It could be as short as a few minutes. It could be as long as a few hours or days. The other problem is we have a chicken-egg problem. Now application need to avoid emit output during the warm-up period because application state during the warm-up period is also incomplete. That's some additional complexity application need to handle. The second issue is ordering issues with high source. With Kafka, the messages are ordered within partition but we cannot get the same kind of behavior, ordering behavior from a Hive source. To understand that, let's first look at how MapReduce process data in a distributed fashion. It's driven by the concept called the input splits. Here I have a Hive table. It has a list of physical files on S3. Those physical files are first divided into logical chunks called the input splits. Then those input splits are assigned to mapper tasks. Optionally, you may have reduced a task for your MapReduce job, but you could also have MapReduce job only have mapper tasks. That's how MapReduce process data in a distributed way. In our implementation, the split calculation is done in job manager once during the job startup time. And those split information get broadcasted to all the task managers. The task managers then run the same split assignment algorithm to determine which input split each subtask needs to process. For example, here we have a simple round robin. Basically, we just modular the split number by the parallelism. If they match the subtask index, then less input split I need to process for the subtask. There's no guarantee of ordering for the high source data because the task manager may process data file from hour 0 first, then hour 23, then hour 12, and finally hour 3. It can be any order. In a batch job, typically if you want ordering, you, you would need to sort the data. But does ordering really matter here? I would say probably not for a status job. 
but all the land is probably important for stateful jobs. In a flink, late event can be dropped after a certain tolerance level. For example, when the watermark is past the end timestamp of the window, then those later arrival events will be dropped. You can add some extra time buffer, like a lot of lateness, but in the end, if the event comes too late, they will be dropped. That's why ordering is important for stateful jobs, at least most of the time. We talk about using high table as a backfill source for failure recovery. Now let's look into the second option, where we use think external checkpoint. First, a quick overview of how Flink checkpoint works. Job manager trigger the, check, uh, trigger the checkpoint. It broadcasts the checkpoint barriers to all the task managers. As the checkpoint barriers flow through the job deck, each operator takes the snapshot of its own state and uploads the snapshot to some distributed file system like HDFS or S3. Checkpoint is how Flink achieves for the tolerance. For example, when the Flink job encountered failure, it, some operator throw exception will cause the job to restart. Flink will automatically rewind the job to the last successful checkpoint. Remember here, Kafka partition offset is part of the application state because it is a state for the Kafka source operator in Flink. So the Kafka offset is rewinded along with the other application state. That's how Flink achieves the exact one's processing semantics. By default, Flink checkpoints are only used for failure recovery within the same job. Those checkpoints will be deleted if the job gets canceled. However, you can enable what Flink calls external checkpoint so that those checkpoints are retained you can start a new job from one of those retained checkpoints to start from. Let's see how we can leverage that Flink external checkpoint. Here we have stateful jobs. It has an outage. After the outage happened, the two more successful checkpoints happen. We can rewind the Flink job to a checkpoint happened before the outage started. Again, the Kafka offset offsets are rewinded along with the other application state. There are no warm-up and ordering issues for Flink rewind option solution because the application state is correct after the rewind. And the Flink job is still working with the same Kafka source, so we get the same ordering behavior. We provide a, a few deployment options. For this discussion, we only care about the first option, where you can start the new job from an existing external checkpoint that taken in the past. Once you choose this option, we will show you the list of checkpoints. The number of checkpoints retained can be configured. On the left column, we have the timestamp. When we have the time when the checkpoint is taken. On the right column, we have the S3 location of the metadata files. You can choose a checkpoint from a time that you want the job to rewind to. Obviously, Kafka retention really matters here. You cannot rewind a Flink job beyond the Kafka retention because those messages may be deleted due to the retention policy. One team at Netflix is asking us, can we have 10 days of retention for Kafka? They are talking about the biggest data stream in Netflix, which have probably terabyte, a terabyte of the raw data every day. Can we do it? We certainly can do it. The real question is, can we do it efficiently in terms of cost? If we look at the data stream over a time domain, we have the current data, and we have the recent data, maybe for the last a few hours or a few days. And we have the historical data, maybe last a few weeks or a few months. 
Right now, we use two different storage systems for the recent data and the historic data. We have Kafka that stores the recent data for a few hours or a few days. Then we have S3 or High where we store the data for last a few weeks or a few months. It's very really difficult to stay to keep 10 days of data on local disk. In AWS EC2 offering, D2 instance has the largest local disk. For example, for the D2.8XL instance, it has 10 gigabits of network and 48 terabytes of disk. It's a lot of disk. If we are just assuming 2 gigabits per second ingestion rate per instance, this is about 20% of the inbound network bandwidth, so it's not that high with this network bandwidth. 10 days of data requires 216 terabytes of local disk. You can see it's very difficult to store 10 days of data on local disk. AWS have this EBS volume, which is a network attached, uh, kind of network attached storage. But the EBS is not cheap. It's more expensive than S3. Here, all the price I'm quoting here is from uh, is a public price that I, on AWS website for US East One region. For the spinning disk EBS, it costs about 4.5 cents per gigabyte per month. Spinning disk works well with Kafka workload. For your reference, the SSD EBS volume is about twice as expensive as a spinning disk. For the S3 standard storage, it costs about 2.1 cents per gigabyte per month. You can see it's about less than 50% of the EBS storage. And S3 provides an even cheaper storage option called infrequent access. It costs about 1.3 cents per gigabyte per month, so which is less than one third of the EBS. The infrequent access tier is, is good for the use case where you access the data infrequently, but you can get very fast access when you need it. The combination of low cost and high performance make the infrequent access tier an ideal storage for failure recovery case that we're talking about today. You can say it's a one third of the EBS cost, less than one third. It has a huge difference when you talk about petabytes of data. What if Kafka can offload historical data to long-term storage, like on S3 infrequent access tier? And when we need to access those historical data, Kafka can either bring the, back, bring the data back to local disk or just self-direct out of S3. The benefit is we only need to deal with Kafka source at the application level. We don't need to implement our own Hive source. And we can, since we use Kafka source, we do not change the job deck. So we can use Fink checkpoint and save point. And we can answer our user question that we can support 10 days of retention more cost efficiently. There are systems implemented as tiered storage like Pulsar and Perviga. It would be interesting to see if Kafka is, is going to do the similar thing or not. We talk about both high backfield solution and the Flink Rewind. Let's take a quick look or compare them. What are the pros and cons of each option? High backfield suffers two issues or with warm up and ordering. With Flink Rewind, those two issues do not exist. That's why we think high backfield only works for stateless jobs, and Flink Rewind works for both stateless and the stateful jobs. In terms of data retention, we can typically keep the data for a few weeks or a few months on our high data warehouse. But for Kafka, we can only keep data for a few hours or a few days. You may wonder if Flink Rewind 
work for both stateless and stateful jobs. Why do we even bother about high backfill solution? Why don't we just use Flink Rewind? There are a few things we really like about high backfill. First, the Hive data warehouse provides long-term storage for up to a few months. Second, the live job continues to run. So there's no delay in processing latest events. Third, we can achieve fast recovery because the backfill job runs in parallel with the live job. And more importantly, we can start the backfill job in a much larger Flink cluster. With a larger uh, Flink cluster, we can get more processing capacity. We can finish the backfill much faster. For example, we can reprocess 24 hours high data within maybe two or three hours. That's why today our recommendation to our users is if you have a status job, use high backfill as your failure recovery solution. But if you have stateful jobs, use Flink Rewind for your failure recovery. In the last section, we're going to talk about some of the caveats we should watch out for, no matter it's a high backfill or Flink Rewind solution. Caveat number one. Don't overwhelm your external dependencies. At a steady state, the Flink job will process the event as it comes in. So the throughput is determined by the incoming message rate. But in a failure recovery case, no matter the high backfill or Flink rewind, we have a backlog. So the Flink job will process the events as fast as it can. If the Flink cluster is over provision, it may process 10x of the throughput compared to steady state. This 10x of load may cause problems for your dependencies. You may wonder why this problem, back pressure kick in, we just apply, apply the back pressure to the Kafka source. The problem is not for the Flink job. The problem we are concerned is on those external dependencies because they may be shared by other clients that are in the critical path of Netflix customer streaming videos. We do not want to affect them. There are a few solutions. For example, we can size the Flink cluster properly, so it will never be too big to overwhelm those external dependencies. A second solution might be, can probably give us more precise control. You can add a rate limit operator into your job deck, so you can throttle your job this can guarantee you will never overwhelm your external dependencies. Caveat number two. Your dependency may not participate in the rewind. Here, I have a simple Flink job, read as a read from Kafka source, and calls the AB service to enrich the data with the AB test allocation information for a user, then write the output to a sync. Let's say it's processing live, live message X. It contains user Alice. So Flink job will ask AB service, what's the test allocation cell for Alice? It will return cell A. Now the AB allocation changed, and we had an outage. So we decide to rewind the Flink job to a checkpoint before the outage started. So we reprocess the same old message X. And this time, when we ask our AB service again, it returns me a different answer, cell B. Obviously, this can affect your computation result. How big of a problem is this? It depends on how fast the AB data change. If the AB data changes very fast, it can affect your result significantly. But if the AB data changes very slow, the impact is likely to be minimal. There are a couple of solutions. First, the AB service can provide a lookup API with a historical view. For example, at 4 p.m., when we are reprocessing the old message X, our Flink job 
can ask the AB service, what's the allocation sale for Alice at 1 p.m. when this event happened? Now AB service can return the correct answer, sale A. However, this is difficult for the AB service to support such a historical view API, so it's unlikely they will do that. The other solution is convert the table lookup to AB service to a streaming source. The flink job will consume from both the regular source and the AB streaming source. When the flink job is processing those AB events, it builds up the internal lookup table. So the AB data become part of the application state. When we rewind the flink job, we rewind the AB data along with the regular data source. This way, we always keep the AB data and the regular data source in sync. Caveat number three, watch out for the impact to your downstream consumers. If you have item potent sync, like Elasticsearch or Cassandra, where you can have a last right win, this problem won't be an issue because the result will be corrected once we're done reprocessing data from the outage period. For the lack of better name, I call the second category resettable sync. For example, if you, if you know some higher partition contains bad data from the outage period, you can just drop those higher partitions and repopulate them once we're done with reprocessing events from the outage period. Here is a more complicated case with Kafka sync. Here I have job one that read from topic one and write to topic two. And I have job two read from topic two and write to topic three. Let's assume at 4 p.m. job one decide to rewind to the 1 p.m. checkpoint to recover from the outage. Now the question is, what should job two do? Should job two rewind to 1 p.m. or should job two rewind to 4 p.m.? To understand that, let's look at, zoom in to look at the topic two. It basically has three sections. On the left, you had good data before the outage started after 1 p.m. In the middle, between 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. is the outage period, which may contain bad data. And on the right, you have all the reprocessing events from 1 p.m. because job one rewinded, and all the new events come after that. If we rewind job two to 1 p.m., we get the correct application state because the application state at 1 p.m. is accumulated over time from good data. But we are still reprocessing bad data from the outage period. If we rewind job two to 4 p.m., we skip the bad data, but we still get a bad application state because the application state built up to 4 p.m. contains the data processing from the outage period, so some bad data. So we may build up incorrect application state at 4 p.m. You can see neither option is correct. Here's one solution. It's a little bit complicated. Let's walk through it. We can stop job one and job two first. Then we can wipe out all the messages from topic two. For example, we can set the Kafka retention to one minute. So we wipe out all the data, including the bad data. Now we rewind job two to 1 p.m. So we get the clock up gain state from 1 p.m. checkpoint. Then we rewind job one to the 1 p.m. checkpoint. It starts to reprocess the event from 1 p.m. and forward. This way, job two get both the correct application state and skip the bad data. You can see it's a quite involved process and the required coordination between job one and job two. So it may be difficult to execute. Let's recap what we talked about on the caveats that we should watch out for. Number one, don't overwhelm your external dependencies. 
consider read limit operator in your job deck to protect those dependencies. Number two, your dependency may not participate in the rewind. Consider convert the table lookup to a streaming source so that you can keep the data in sync. Number three, watch out for the impact to your downstream consumers. Before I, I think we may have two minutes for questions, let me leave you with this one final note. Failure doesn't define us. What defines us is how well we rise after failure. I encourage you to think about your own failure recovery stories. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. So I think we do have time for just one or two questions. Yes. So um, we'll try to do that real quick. Uh, and if we run out of time, Stephen's going to hang out up here for any other questions you might have. Uh, all right. Do we have another mic or? All right. Cool. <laughs> You can grab this mic if you want. <laughs> All right. All right, questions? In the back? All right. Yeah, I can have a first question. Hi. Um, you, you said about this problem of having a single API on the Kafka data and S3 data, but do you actually solve it? I, th I think I missed No, the I think we're hoping that if Kafka provides such solution, that will really help us. All right, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, when you have to, like, when you deal with um, stateful jobs and recovery uh, from rewind, uh, do you ever uh, use uh, jobs with uh, in memory and uh, state and snapshotting, or only a RocksDB back state? Uh, I don't think uh, uh, the state option matters here. Either option can work because the state will be uploaded to the distributed file system. Uh, it's more like uh, the follow-up part of the question is, uh, do you ever experience uh, problems uh, when you recover from big in-memory states? Like, in, my, in our case, we've seen problems with, uh, like, depending on how fast time passes, sometimes fling state grows unboundedly. Even though windows should be closed, uh, they seem to be not like, being processed or something. Uh, we didn't, uh, weren't able to get to the root cause yet. But we had this problem when recovering from really big backlog uh, with stateful processing. You mean when the state backend, the in-memory backend? Uh, in-memory backend, when, you, uh, when we had to recover, for instance, like uh, after a day. Uh, good question. I think for usually a pretty big state, we use RocksDB as a state backend. And uh, I don't think that we use in-memory state backend for a very large state. So I'm personally not very familiar with that problem. But I would love to talk to you offline to understand your story. All right, I think we're out of time right now, but thank you everyone for coming and thank you, Stephen. Thank you.